You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get started with this week's show, which is an amazing episode. If you're curious about the details of how Saddam Hussein was captured, this week's guest was part of the team that found him. So stay tuned for that. An amazing story. But we do want to give a quick shout out to a listener, Troy, who donated to the podcast this past week. We don't solicit for donations, guys. We certainly appreciate them and we're super grateful to those who have chosen to donate. We take that money, we put it right back into the show, and we put it towards some of the fees that are associated with keeping this podcast going. As well, everybody who requested stickers from us last week, they went out. So keep a lookout for them. Hopefully they'll make it to you guys. If they don't, certainly reach back out to us. And some of you may be saying, what sticker are you talking about? Well, it's a sticker of the Hazard Ground logo. Just a little swag to get out to you guys in our way of saying thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground community. But if you want one, email us or DM us on social media with your name and your address, and we'll send one out to you. If you're going to DM us on social media, please make sure you're following us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we continue to grow this followership in this Hazard Ground community. Finally, a reminder about our promotion with Amazon. Go to our website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab right at the top of the homepage. You can do all your normal Amazon shopping, and we'll get a percentage of what you guys spend. We donate it right back to some of the organizations and charities featured here on the show. And so we certainly appreciate you guys helping out veterans all across the country just by listening to this podcast and going to hazardground.com. Once again, we thank you guys so much for supporting this show, being fans of it, and certainly continuing to help spread the word. Now let's get right into another fantastic episode of The Hazard Ground. And joining us this week on the show is a retired Army Master Sergeant who spent over 20 years in the U.S. Army. He served in such notable units as 3rd Ranger Battalion, 3rd Infantry Division, and the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as Special Operations Command. He also was part of 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta. He served on 11 combat deployments over 500 combat operations, including the capture of Saddam Hussein. He is Chris Van Sant joining us on the Hazard Ground. Chris, welcome, man. Good to talk to you. Mark, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. So definitely a long and distinguished career and a lot of uh, notable things that you have been part of. Uh, I'm excited to hear about all of it, especially the Saddam Hussein one, because we've talked to a bunch of people who have been close to that, but not many people who have kind of been on the inside of it. But that said, uh, where does your military career start? Uh, started, uh, I enlisted straight out of high school. i um, 18 years old, born and raised in, uh, in Dover, Delaware. Um, you know, kind of your typical suburban upbringing, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm one of those guys that falls into the, the category of uh, I knew I needed some structure. I knew I needed uh, – you know, some guidance I needed to push myself, uh, and I needed some discipline. I was a bit of a wild child and, and kind of drank and partied a lot when I was younger. Um, so, uh, as much as I wanted to go play college baseball, I knew that probably the best path for me was in the service. Um, so I enlisted in, in 1995 straight out of high school and went to, to, as a, as an, as an infantryman and went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, when you enlisted, I mean, we're in a peacetime environment. Uh, what were your parents saying? What, were you, what was your family saying? Um, th- for the most part, they were pretty accepting of it. Um, I had two, uh, both my grandfathers, uh, so on my mom's and my dad's side, um, both were World War II veterans. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I found the military appealing was was my mom's father in particular. Um, I was the youngest of, of all his grandchildren and Consequently, that meant I got kind of the good him later in life more than than the rest of my cousins. Um, and I listened to, to that man tell war stories um, later in life, which he, he never talked about with anyone else and none of his kids. But he, but for whatever reason, he got to a point in his life where he shared that stuff with me. And, you know, whether they were good stories or bad stories, he talked about them with such reverence, like with with just a light in his eye that that even the bad stories meant so much to him. And I think that impacted me to a point that it made my decision very easy. Um, And I think my family kind of knew that they understood um, why I was doing what I was doing. I think, you know, my father, absolutely. My father was a, was a, um, you know, was 18 when, when the middle of the Vietnam war was happening and he was 
uh, a new father shortly thereafter. And he knew the potential of him getting drafted was, was there and real. Um, and he actually enlisted in the reserves. Uh, he figured he would take the power away and, and, and sign up himself. And he never actually deployed to Vietnam, but he understood what service meant. So I don't think, I don't think anyone really had an issue or took issue with me enlisting. Were you thinking about combat when you signed up? I mean, was that anything that was in your mind? Uh, y- y- yes and no. Um, I mean, I think I always kind of had the mindset of you don't want to practice for something your entire life and never actually get in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I watched the first Gulf War on TV like everybody else, you know, being kind of the first real televised war. Um, I don't know that I really understood all of it, but I, I knew that at some point – getting in the game was the reality and it, and it was something that I frankly look forward to. Well, when you say it was a reality, the only reason I asked that is because look, it was the Clinton years, you know, I long for the days and all we had to worry about was a president having an affair with an intern. I mean, you know, life, life was so much simpler <laughs> back then, but I mean, that's, you know, my point was, is that we weren't involved in anything. Like there was nothing going on, at least not openly, obviously covertly there were things going on, but openly it, it was, you know, one of the decades of peace that we had during the Clinton years. Yeah, it was a different time for sure. Um, Yeah, I I think I, you know, more so looked forward to the training. I looked forward to the challenge of service. Um, I I wanted to be an infantryman because I, well, actually, I I wanted to be a special operations guy, um, but you you didn't really have that option. And I looked at all the services um, and, and talked with recruiters from each of the services, uh, which was entertaining, to put it lightly. But um, I settled with the army because I felt like the path to um, more uh, selective or specialized training and advanced training and, and special operations. I thought the path to that on the army side was was shorter um, than other places, and I felt like if you didn't succeed where you landed, you know, as a as a paratrooper or whatever, was a better landing spot than if you tried to go the special operations route in another service and it didn't work out and you were in some career field that you hated. Makes sense. All right. So you're off to basic, uh, you know, and then uh, AIT kind of take me through the whole process. Where do you end up uh, as your first duty station? Uh, Yeah, basic and AIT at Benning. Um, I actually, uh, I thought I had enlisted with an Airborne Ranger contract. Um, there was a, a, so 11 Bravo infantrymen with an airborne ranger contract, which meant I was going to go to airborne school after basic and then, mm-hmm. and then to ranger indoctrination training. And in basic training, I found out that uh, there was a contract snafu, um, which I didn't know till much later, but I ended up going through 11 Charlie or, or indirect fire infantry when I was a mortar guy, yeah. um, in, in AIT. So I completed basic training. I discussed that snafu with the leadership at the time because they were going to send me to Fort Riley, Kansas. And I said, Hey, you know, I thought this was the deal. And, and honestly, to their credit, they ended up sorting it out to the point where they did get me an airborne slot. So instead of going to Fort Riley, Kansas to be a mechanized infantry mortarman, um, I ended up going to airborne school, um, graduated airborne school while I was there. I volunteered, uh, just like they told me was going to happen. Um, the, the ranger instructors came down and asked for volunteers to attend the, the what was then RIP, the Ranger Indoctrination Program. And I volunteered and, and I, I went to RIP, um, graduated RIP and was assigned to uh, 3rd Ranger Battalion right there at Fort Benning. So didn't leave uh, as my first duty station. All right. And so when this is all said and done, what is it? It's 1998, somewhere in that time frame, 97? Uh, no, this is uh, 95, 96. Okay. So it's still that early. All right. So between yep. then and 9-11, kind of what's going on in your military career? Uh, so I spent about a year in 3rd Ranger Battalion. Um, I, I guess I should preface this thing with, you know, I made a lot of mistakes over my, my military career. Um, I learned a lot of lessons kind of the hard way. Um, I, I like to say now that I, I made enough mistakes over the course of my life to finally figure out how to be successful. Um, so I wouldn't change any of it, but after about a year in third range battalion, I, I had a, a alcohol related incident. I got a, I got a DUI as a, as a young kid, um, driving a friend home from a bar. Um, you know, the drinking culture was very common in the military. It was kind of a culture of we're okay if you drink because you're old enough to go to war for your country. Just don't get caught. Um, and I got caught. <laughs> and the regimental policy, the 75th Ranger Regiment policy at the time was if you had an alcohol-related incident, you had to leave the regiment. 
So after about a year of, of kind of heavy training and, and being an Army Ranger, um, I was up for worldwide assignment, as they say. Um, and they reassigned me to 3rd Infantry Division, um, still on Fort Benning, ironically. So I went to 3rd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division, which was a mechanized infantry battalion. So I went from Airborne Ranger Infantry to Mechanized Infantry, which was a, a huge change. Uh, and I spent a couple of years there. Um, we actually did a deployment to Kuwait in that stretch, um, Operation Desert Thunder or whatever. It was kind of the show of force operations in, in Kuwait um, on the ground side while we were patrolling the airspace above Iraq post-Gulf War. And that was a good deployment. Learned a lot, did a lot. Um, enjoyed being an, a, a, an indirect fire infantryman, a mortarman. Um, you know, learn the trade, learn fire direction control, you know, really wanted to advance and excel. Um, and then I was coming up on my first reenlistment and, uh, I had a great battalion commander, um, and he was trying to get me to stay and I wasn't sure I was going to stay. I, honestly, I, I thought I was going to get out because I had had that incident and I was afraid it was going to haunt me for the rest of my career. I was young and naive and, and, you know, thought, man, I got a, I got a letter of reprimand for this DUI. It's going to, it's going to hang over my head forever and I'm not going to get promoted and all that stuff. But so far things were going pretty good. And, and, you know, that battalion commander said, you know, we can move that letter of reprimand to your, to your restricted file. Um, and you were young enough that it's not going to impact you. And, you know, what do I got to do to get you to stay? Um, and he said some nice things and, um, I had done well in my time there. It was fairly easy to excel in, in a unit like that, um, coming from where I came from. Um, and, uh, and so I ended up reenlisting and, and going to the 82nd airborne division and I was assigned to second three, two, five infantry. Um, so I was back in an airborne unit that was exciting. Um, and I was assigned to a line company as a mortar section sergeant at the time. Um, yeah, so that put me in the 82nd. That was, that was probably, uh, I guess I'm round about 1998, time frame still no ranger school um, on the horizon no no uh, weirdly I, I missed my window because of the dui mm -hmm. um I, I went to third id and and uh you know we deployed and i was busy the whole time so none there and then went to the 82nd and the the nice thing about the 82nd was they trained um it was a peacetime 82nd but we were in the woods all the time uh and i love that and and i was a mortar section sergeant so I, you know, I was sort of a platoon sergeant and a platoon leader. I had my own group of guys that I was responsible for, um, and and I could schedule training and do training. So we stayed busy uh, as much as we could. Well, for the record, you missed the wrong side of the third ID deport. If you were at, you know, Fort Stewart, you would you would have been hating life in the in the Fort Stewart woods, uh, getting bit by mosquitoes and everything else for ten months out of the year. So you you kind, yeah. of, you kind of lucked out from that standpoint, I guess. Uh, but depending on how you look at it, so. Uh, let, let's fast forward. Where are you on 9-11 and what's going on? Uh, so 9-11, so in the 82nd, I spent a couple of years in the line company as a mortar section sergeant. Um, and then I had a, a good friend that was a platoon leader um, that uh, I used to befriend the platoon leaders and they would come in because I, I shared the, the company, you know, CP or command post with all the platoon leaders and platoon sergeants. And um, he got a second platoon he got the scout platoon in hhc and he asked me to come over and take a team in the scouts which was kind of unheard of for an 11 charlie that was a that was kind of an 11 bravo you know line squad leader move um but uh we had a conversation he said hey you know tactics you are phenomenal with your guys you're a trainer you're a pt stud you know why don't you come take a team and i didn't know how to do it and he said, well, it's an easy transition from 11 Charlie to 11 Bravo. You just do a 4187 and the commander signs it. And I said, that's it? And he goes, yeah, you're an infantry man. It's just a lateral transfer. Um, so I did that. Um, I switched from 11 Charlie to, to straight up 11 Bravo infantry. Um, I, Because of the way the points and promotion system was set up, 11 Charlie's points to get promoted uh, to E6 were really high and 11 Bravo were really low. Um, so when I reclassed to 11 Bravo, I was immediately promoted E6 and I took a scout team. Did that for a while. 9-11 um, happened. I was in the field. We were actually in the middle of a training exercise. Um, I remember the day like it was yesterday. Um, I got a call over the command net on the radio and they said, um, and again, we were in the middle of an exercise where I had Op 4 looking for us and we were out doing a surveillance exercise 
Um, so I thought it was a joke when they said, you know, index, stop what you're doing and report back to the company command post. Um, I, I was like, ah, oh, this is like psyops or something. Uh, so, <laughs> Trying to be so one I step went, ahead, Chris. Yeah. So I went back and forth with them for a minute and, and I could hear it in their voice, like the gravity of whatever it was. Um, so we stopped what we were doing and we packed up and, and, uh, went back to the, to the company CP and, and the company commander at the time explained to us that, uh, that a plane had just hit one of the world trade center towers. Um, and that another had hit the Pentagon. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was like a ton of bricks. Um, and they shortly thereafter, they loaded us on trucks and we went back to the battalion area and literally everybody went to the day rooms and straight to the TVs and turned the news on. And, and we kind of, kind of sat there and watched the events unfold. Did you think at that moment, okay, we're going to war. I'm finally going to get called up to the game, so to speak. I did. I did. So it was a really interesting time for me. Um, I had, uh, so a year prior to that, I had attended um, selection for, for a special mission unit and I was unsuccessful. Um, so they had asked me to attend. I had gone through 99% of the course and the day before the last event, they had pulled me um, for, for failure to meet the time standard, as they say. Um, but they had asked me to return and, you know, I waited a year to return and, and they run that course two times a year in the fall and the spring. I wanted to wait a year because I wanted to go during the same season. So the terrain looked as familiar as possible for me. And um, I had a class date, uh, a selection date to return to. Uh, and I was also I was also on orders to be a drill instructor at Fort Benning. Oh, wow. Um, so so I had all this stuff. I had 9-11 happen. Oh, my God, I'm going to go to war. But I'm also in this limbo period where I'm getting ready to go attend a special mission unit selection. And if I'm unsuccessful, I'm going to end up being a drill instructor right back where I started at Fort Benning, Georgia. So it was it was a it was kind of a crazy time in my life. To that end, I mean, d did the thought of being a drill instructor like nauseate you? <laughs> it really did. It did. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had some phenomenal drill instructors. No, and that's that but that's I, not yeah. No, that's not a referendum on drill instructors. Some people like yeah. it. Some people it's for. Some people it's not. But in the same respect, when you have, I, I mean, and again, when I say higher aspirations, you're talking about an elite unit that less than you know five percent of the army actually is a part of. So yeah, that's higher aspirations. I mean, I, I don't mean to downplay it again, but a lot of people can become drill instructors. Not everybody can go be part of an elite unit. It, to to me, it was it was extreme motivation. I, I felt like if I was unsuccessful in my in my second bid to to do something like that, um, that yeah, I could go to to special forces assessment selection and try to become a green beret. Um, but where I really wanted to be was the organization I was trying out for. And I felt right. like if it didn't work out, and I ended up as a drill instructor, that was like the final nail in the coffin that I just kind of reside myself to being a regular army guy. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No. It just wasn't where, wasn't where my aspirations were, were. And all this was going on prior to 9-11, correct? Yeah, all of that was in the lead up. Okay. And then, like I said, you know, 9-11 happened. Um, we came back. Uh, and it, it, I mean, you want to talk about feeling personally motivated to achieve something. I, I was returning for the second time. Um, you know, 9-11 happened. I knew we were going to war, and here I was going to try out for the most elite unit in the world. All right, so is th in that early part of 2002, is that when you – the spring of 2002 is when you went back? No, no, no. That was uh, – that would have been uh, September of one. Oh, I thought you said um, you were going in the fall. Are you going in the spring again? Oh, I was. So I, I went a I went a year prior in the fall. So I went the fall of two thousand to selection and right. was unsuccessful. Okay. And then a whole year goes by. Nine eleven happens, and then about a week or two later, I was due to leave to go to selection. So gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, I I was in my window. All right. So then you head off to assessment and selection again. What happens next? Um. So return to selection. Uh. It, it, it went very well. I mean, if I'm honest, I actually felt like I was slower the second time. Um, but I was so confident in, in my decision making and my route finding, you know, land navigation is sort of the medium that, that at least the army special mission unit uses to assess candidates. Um, it's a very individual based thing, unlike, you know, Green Beret selection and, and kind of some other selections out there um, in that, you know, nobody tells you you have to go this fast, go this slow. 
they sort of just give you a start and give you a finish. Um, and you kind of continue on in that fashion at your own self-induced pace. Um, and I felt, I literally felt like I didn't move as fast, but my, my route finding and my, my decision-making was much quicker and the level of confidence that I had, I think is what made me successful the second time. Obviously no road kills, right? No, no. (laughs) The, uh, it all went well. I guess if I had one kind of joke highlight out of the whole thing, um, is when I finished, uh, you know, you attend a board at the completion of selection and they ask a myriad of questions. And I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of questions about my past. Um, I think they were trying to see where my head was, you know, having had a DUI and left the Ranger regiment and, and they kind of picked on that a little bit. Um, but you know, at one point I answered a question with, with, you know, I always give 110%. Yes, I've made mistakes in my life, but I, you know, I, I approach everything that I do, you know, as absolutely hard as I can go at it. And one of the events during the course, um, you were tasked with this thing and, and, you know, it was kind of a two part thing where details were important, but at the same time, speed was important. And in my mind, I thought, well, the first time I didn't make it because I wasn't fast enough. So I'm going to wait speed more than detail. Um, and so in the board, they pulled out a, uh, a drawing that I did, um, on a, on a reconnaissance piece that looked like, uh, a two-year-old drew it. And they said, is this an example of you giving 110%? (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And, and, And I'm sure, I'm sure my face showed the embarrassment, but you know, I responded with, look, I, I conducted a risk assessment. The first time I didn't make it through this course, I was told I failed to meet the time standard. So I assumed that doing this quickly was more relevant than all of the detail. So I took a chance and, and probably didn't do as good a job on it as I thought I should. And, and thankfully and luckily for me, it worked out. Unfortunately, what you're not allowed to respond with in those moments is, what are you guys, an art critic? I mean, give me a break here. You know? like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's the most intimidating situation I had ever been into that point. You know, you have a group of people that you, that you literally view as a young soldier, as, as superheroes. And I, I, I mean, I think they knew I was in awe. They were very aware of how young I was. I was 23 years old at the time. And, and uh, you know, back then, I say that like it was forever ago, but, but you know, in that time period, they didn't really take guys that young. I barely sure. met the minimum requirements. Um, and they made that clear to me that that they were going to select me, but that they were taking a chance on me because I was so young and that wasn't something they normally did. All right. So when you, when do you get to your first of eleven deployment, or you know the the uh, post nine eleven deployment era? When do you start that whole cycle? Uh, so I went to the operator training course, about six months long, and then you have some specialty schools thereafter. Um, I completed the operator training course uh, round about uh, early summer of of two thousand and two. Um, and I was assigned to one of the Sabre squadrons, the C squadron, and they happened to be already deployed forward to Afghanistan in the middle of a combat rotation. Um, there were four of us. Uh, so we basically reported to the Sabre squadron. We were in briefed and in processed. We were issued a bunch of gear. We packed a bunch of gear and I got on one of the rotator flights um, and I joined my first team in a special mission unit in Afghanistan in the middle of a combat deployment. And what was that mission like? Uh, different then. So Afghanistan obviously has evolved many times so over much, over yeah. the years. Yeah. And at the time, you know, <clears throat> there were some operations that happened immediately post 9-11 um, where we wanted to show – the bad guys for lack of a better term that we had the ability to hit them anywhere and anytime. Um, and we did so. Um, and that organization was responsible for doing those things along with some other, you know, special forces teams that were doing things in Afghanistan. Um, so we were targeting intelligence was very different than collection was very different than we didn't have the resources that we have years later, but, um, you know, I think the squadron as a whole only did about eight, um, you know, sort of direct action type missions that rotation. I participated 
in about the second half of that rotation. And then we did some other surveillance and reconnaissance and some route reconnaissance and some other, other non-traditional things. But, um, yeah, I think I, I got there. I met my team. I think I did one sort of training run with my team to sort of feel each other out. Um, they were an incredible group of guys. And then and not even a week and a half or two weeks into it, I was doing my first, you know, combat assault in, uh, in Gardez, Afghanistan. You know, when you get to that point, did you feel all the training you had done up to this point, because it has been so specialized and so high level, prepared you adequately for what you were, you were facing in combat? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, the training that I got in the operator training course is incredible. Um, but there's always a gap between training and reality, right? There is. And I, I didn't really, I guess in Afghanistan, when I got there, the things that we did or the missions that I took part in were very similar to the training that I had done in the course. Um, or, or, or some of it, I felt like I was prepared for what I was asked to do in that first trip to Afghanistan. Now that changed, um, before my second deployment, um, which was the invasion of Iraq, but, uh, where we were doing things that I, that we had never done. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but that first trip, I did feel prepared. Um, I felt like even if I messed up, I was surrounded by, I was in the company of heroes, like guys that were phenomenal at what they did. And, and I felt like they were going to police me up. Even if I, even if I messed up, you mentioned the invasion of Iraq and, uh, that was for all intents and purposes. I mean, really it was fairly flawless in the grand scheme, right? As far as the insertion from Kuwait all the way up to Baghdad, how quick they moved, how, how much you guys were able to get to the resistance, you know, that, what was it, 96-hour period, I guess it was, um, you know, what was your role in that whole thing? Yeah, so we, um, being part of sort of the Tier 1 Special Operations Unit in the Army, we were actually tasked with uh, finding and locating WMD um, primarily in the western portions of the country. So okay. Iraq then was littered with um, ammo supply points or ASPs. Yep. And they were kind of all spread out all over the desert. And intelligence at the time believed that if they possessed, you know, nuclear, biological or chemical weapons, that they were going to be in that Western region, um, not in a, in a densely populated area like Baghdad or Tikrit or, or Mosul. So we started in, in Saudi Arabia um, we staged in RR Saudi Arabia. It was a, a true desert mobility mission, um, you know, a la, you know, North Africa and World War II, you know, light skinned vehicles covering vast distances and kind of hitting objectives along the way. Um, so we crossed the border uh, roughly two days before the air war in Iraq began. OK. Um, so before the first bombs were dropped, we. Took out some outposts, which um, is typical for your elite unit at that point. Yeah, I mean they're, they're yeah, going yeah. away I ahead mean, of the main assault force. It, it, yeah, it felt very standard practice. It got us a, a, a you know a, a footprint on the ground, um, and it allowed us to to have the element of surprise in some of those western locations. So, so yeah, we crossed the border and kind of day to day conducted missions and hit various targets along the way. Um, and, uh, what was the level of resistance like? Um, so initially, initially it was easy. Uh, we would, you know, encounter some of these ammo supply points. There'd be one or two, you know, guards at whatever location. Um, we got in a couple little skirmishes, but for the most part, like they had no idea who we were. I mean, we, you know, it's the, the elements of CQB, right? Speed, surprise, violence of action, even though we were doing a mobility mission when we would hit a target, you know, we would hit them with such aggression and force and speed that they didn't want any part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there was a lot of air defense sites that were out West that, you know, we had the ability to see them from a long way away because of some technology that we employed and, and we would call in close air support and, and kind of drop bombs on all of those air defense sites in the Western portion of the country. So it was relatively mild <coughs> for a while. Um, and then 
to April of 2003 um, was our first sort of big engagement. Uh, we, we drove a little too long. The sun came up. Um, some, some sheep herders saw us, you know, pull into our rest over day site to try to hide. And, and cause that's what we would do. We would hide during the day. And then at night we would cover ground and, and hit objectives. And, and, uh, he went into town and recruited a bunch of fighters and we ended up getting, getting hit, um, kind of on three sides from really an overwhelming force from about three to 400, uh, bad guys. You sustain any casualties? We did. So, yeah, 2 April, uh, we had a few guys get, get wounded from some RPG frag, um, and we had uh, Andy Fernandez, um, which I believe Andy was, was actually, if not the first, he was definitely the first special operations um, KIA. But uh, Andy took a round in one side and out the other um, during the initial engagement um, and unfortunately uh, didn't make it. You know, you you do so much specialized training, and you guys are so good at what you do, uh, especially for somebody who is new, relatively new to the whole uh, environment like you were. When, when somebody gets killed like that, what goes on in your mind? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, in training coming up, you know, Eagle Down is the call. Eagle Down is the call that, that one of your mates is, is wounded or injured, um, and you hear it in training and you react to it in training, but it never really, um, hits you until it happens in real life. And the, the day that, you know, on April 2nd, we had so much going on. I mean, it was, it was kind of a, a controlled chaos situation and that we were vastly outnumbered, but we had, we had ballistic overmatch, you know, we had the ability to reach out and touch them. And in, in relatively short order, we had close air support. So, we, you know, we could hold our own, but that Eagle down call coming early on in that engagement was like a slap in the face. It was, this is real. Um, I'm at war. This is different than Afghanistan. Um, you just, when you're out in the desert like that, you feel very exposed. Um, and you feel very equal on the battlefield. Whereas in a normal situation, you know, in a, in a CT type environment, you know, where you do have the elements of CQB speed, surprise and violence of action, you know, you arrive on target in a helo, you have night vision, you have all these things. Well, this is broad daylight in the middle of the desert, you know, trying to find cover behind the smallest piece of dirt. And now you got somebody that's wounded. So it was definitely, for me, it was the first real, holy shit, um, we could die here. I mean, as I was going to say, is there a sense of, you know, you looked at these guys as superheroes. If somebody like Andy Fernandez could go down, what could happen to you, so to speak? Right. Right. And to make matters worse with, you know, in Andy's scenario, you know, I had, I had done the trip to Afghanistan, come back, we had done training for, you know, six or seven months. And then, and then we launched for the invasion of Iraq. Uh, you know, Andy had just gotten to, to squadron. He was a brand new guy so much so that when his call sign came over the radio, when they said Eagle down and gave his call sign, we weren't sure who it was because he oh, was really? a newer guy on a team. And, and it wasn't until later on in the day that, we learned who it was. Um, we were separated by a piece of train, the two troops. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't next to Andy when that happened. So I heard the radio call. We actually had to deal with the threat that had engaged them. Um, and then the fighting went on for hours. So it wasn't, uh, we really didn't even have time to assess it until much later. Wow. All right. So, uh, when does the, uh, that deployment end, the, the invasion of Iraq and or what's next as far as after the initial sort of push, goes away yeah so we we continued on we actually ended up um in Tikrit. um we did you know some some hits on some former bath party headquarters on some saddam palaces and, and various things uh the city at the time um really most people had fled the city because they knew what was coming uh you had the marine expeditionary force that was pushing up from the south um, and it was obvious, you know, there were Cobra helicopters that you could see on the skyline and, and bombs being dropped. So when we hit the city of Tikrit and the targets that we hit, they were, they were almost empty. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of funny moments in there, but then at, at some point we were bumped out, we were bumped out by another squadron. Um, and we redeployed, that was probably the May, 
ish. So April, March, April, all of April. Yeah. So it's probably end of May that we redeployed back to the States. Um, and then, you know, that was sort of a, it was an interesting time in Iraq. You know, there was the invasion, which was rapid and quick and over relatively fast. Yep. And then from a special operations standpoint, we very quickly transitioned into high value target targeting. So, you know, back then we called him the deck of cards, right? You had Saddam as yep. the ace of spades. And then you had all of his underlings of importance um, were, the, were the deck of 52. And uh, kind of our mission or as an organization was to, to hunt down those deck of cards, cats. All right. But you get back, you, you go back to the States and then you come back to Iraq again. When? I do. Yeah. We went home. Um, we actually, we redeployed early uh, in September for, the, for what was dubbed the first surge, um, which was interesting. We did some two squadron hits, which, you know, that many special mission unit operators hitting one target is kind of a wild thing. Um, it's not something that we normally do, but we surged for about 30 days in the month of September. Uh, and then I came back home. Um, and the reason we surged was they thought they had a line on Saddam at the time. Mm -hmm. This is September, September of 03. Turned out it was a bunch of, as we call them, dry holes. Um, we didn't find the guy that we were looking for. Uh, so we redeployed at the end of September, early October, and then I went back, I think, like November 1st or right at the tail end of October for my true second rotation to Iraq. All right. And this is the, uh, this is the time where you guys get Saddam. Yeah, yeah. So that rotation, uh, we deployed back, and, and literally that was our focus. Um, there were lots of stuff going on throughout the country, um, you know, just trying to get a handle on where we are in Iraq now that we've – destabilize this government and where do we go next but for us you know we were wholeheartedly pursuing saddam hussein and you know there were some targets that happened you know there were some deck of cards guys that we rolled up in that stretch um and for the most part uh, you know a successful operation is when you don't ever have to pull the trigger and there was a lot of those there was a lot of targets where these big bad dudes that had done some awful things, they wanted no part of us. Um, so, you know, in those days we were doing a lot of assaults where, you know, we were blowing charges and, and aggressively taking targets, but guys were just rolling over. Um, and it kind of, is that a relief? A yeah. I was going to say, is that a relief or is that kind of like one of those things where you're like, damn it, I'm, I'm, I came here to do something. No, I mean, I guess I never felt that way. I, I, maybe some people do. But I always felt like a successful operation was when you get who you're after and no shots have to be fired. Right. Um, and, and I felt like if we did everything right, uh, that's what happened. Um, and, it, and it did a lot of times then. So if anything, it, it built confidence in our, in our TTPs. It built confidence in the way that we executed targets. Um, you know, the battlefield evolves just like we do. So, you know, you know, that's not going to be the case forever. But at the time, it felt like things were going really well. I'm not going to ask you to make an indictment on our intelligence community, but given that you had done so many of these things and you were still looking for the big guy and you hadn't found him yet, were you starting to lose any faith in the intelligence or did you just feel <laughs> like this was going to be something that was, you know, eventually going to, the domino was going to fall? You know, it, it, it became a joke. Um, we did so many hits. It, it, it was, but like with these hits always, that you said, this is it. We're going. We, we have Saddam, and this is, and you end up getting somebody else, or no one. Yes, <laughs> um, and, and it was it was twenty four seven. So we would we would do an assault at ten o'clock in the morning. We would come home, we would refit, and then they would throw something else at us, and we would do an assault. You know that evening. So like sleep was a premium. You know you used to get some when you could, um, but we were running twenty four hours just chasing our tail trying to find this guy and the intelligence community to its credit or discredit, you know, stuff was coming from everywhere. Right. Um, we really, you know, kind of one of the parts of the story that most people don't know is, is, you know, there was a guy on the, on the special operations side, there was, there was an intelligence guy that, that had a good thought process. He had, really done some good target assessment on Saddam and his network and how he was doing things. 
And he said some things early on that none of us believed. And like I said, we were, we felt like we were chasing our tail. So it got to be kind of a laughing stock. Like, Oh, here we go again. Um, almost to the point of complacency. And I wouldn't say we got complacent. We still conducted business as usual, but it, it, when it becomes that repetitive, it just gets a little old. And, but this intelligence guy, you know, he had said some things early on. He said, you know, th- this is the way it's going to be. When it finally plays out, there's going to be one person that truly knows where he is. And he's going to be the, the gatekeeper, the, the golden nugget, the key. And then Saddam is going to be someplace in proximity to Tikrit because he's from that area. Samara, I think, is his original hometown. And he's going to be near a river because Saddam, historically, he eats fish every day. He's also very uh, skeptical of people and very protective of himself. So he only surrounds himself with his most trusted agents. And one of those people is going to be whoever's taking care of him. Um, and what ended up happening was <clears throat> we finally got a lead in Baghdad of all places. And we were chasing a guy named Mohammed Ibrahim al Muslit. And Muslit, we believed was, and, and again, there's a whole bunch of pieces that feed into this, which are kind of irrelevant, but we believe Muslit was the key. Uh, at least this, our intelligence guy believed that Muslit was the key to finding Saddam. Um, so we hit a house in Baghdad. Uh, it was it was a dry hole, as we say. Didn't get the guy, um, but he through some other intelligence collection, he sort of popped up, um, and he was about a block away from where we were. Um, so we, you know, quickly did a hasty plan, moved on to a follow-on target. I was actually a team breacher at the time, and it was kind of a split townhome. So we we hit both sides of this thing. Um, and as I'm placing the breach on the door on the right side of this town home, uh, a guy comes to the door. So he either heard me or he heard the team next to us on the other door, but he comes to the door. And, you know, when you're a breacher, you're sitting there, your rifle was slung behind your back. You're using your hands to put a charge on the door. And the only thing I could think to do was pull my pistol and stick it, you know, up at the glass in his face. So I pull my pistol out and I stick it up at the door and I motion to him to open the door. And so he, you know, he's got a pistol in his face. So he does, um, he opens the door, we enter, I push the guy against the wall and the rest of the team flows in. We assault this tiny little townhome or apartment. Um, literally he's the only guy in there, at least, you know, to us and in doing secondary searches and kind of going back through every nook and cranny of this tiny little place, um, lo and behold in the bedroom, hiding underneath the bed in about an eight inch space is another dude. Um, so we flipped the mattress up, pulled this guy out. Uh, the joke of that was he had a, a tiny little, uh, he had a, actually had a toy AK 47 laying next to him. <laughs> and <clears throat> yeah. And so lucky for him, he didn't pick it up. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so we, we pull this guy out, you know, we're doing traditional battlefield interrogation, asking these guys questions on target, you know, while we still got the element of capture shock and, and, you know, they're not saying much and, and not giving anything up. The guy, Neither one of them looks like the picture of the guy that we're after, or at least the photo that we had. Um, so again, you know, the joke with us is, ah, it's another dry hole. But there were some weird things that happened. Um, you know, the guy had he had several hundred dollar bills in his wallet, the one that we pulled out from under the bed, and they were sequential bills, um, like U.S. one hundred dollar bills, like U.S. crisp U.S. one hundred dollar bills, Benjamins, and they were sequential and. Didn't put this together till after the fact, but the only way you would have sequent, the only random possible explanation for sequential hundred dollar bills is if they came out of a large sum of money, sum of money that was pulled out of a banking institution at one time, right? Like like massive amounts. So again, we didn't put that together. We're all bitching and complaining, like, oh yeah, no, yet another dry hole. This is getting ridiculous. You know, we've done thousands of hits at this time. Like, like, come on. Like, we're never going to find this guy. Maybe he's dead. So we take this guy back to, to Baghdad International where the detention facility was. And and uh, our, our intelligence guy, the one that, that we, you know, that had a beat on what he felt was how we were going to find Saddam all along. <clears throat> we, we He meets us at, at the place along with a couple of interrogators and some other folks we were working with. And we drop these cats off. And uh, And Walt was his name. And Walt said to us in passing, I think this is the guy. And we're like, what? And he's like, no, I, I think this is the guy. So you guys, you know, go back 
get some rest, but be ready. And so, you know, sort of jokingly rimming Walt, we leave and we're like, there's no way it's another garbage lead. It's another guy that's going to lead to nothing. So we go home, uh, to be honest with you, we hadn't slept in a long time. So we, we like drank a couple of beers in the room and, and literally all laid down to get some sleep. This is, I don't know, probably two o'clock in the morning at that point. Um, about two hours go by four or 5. AM <clears throat> the same intelligence guy comes running in now back at, at, at our house where we're staying in Baghdad. And he's like, Hey, you guys got to get up. This is the dude. He spilled the beans. He's, he's the golden ticket. He gave up where Saddam is. He totally knows where he is. He's on a farm outside of Samara, outside of Tikrit, near the river, blah, 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 blah. So we get up, we get dressed, we get in the vehicles. How pissed are you at Walt at this point in time? Uh, <laughs> I, right, right then and there, pretty friggin' pissed. Um, <laughs> and, and again, it's kind of hard to explain. You would think you would be excited, but we had done so many. We right, were exhausted. Right. And so, you know, we, we, they had thrown Muslid in a, in a helicopter and flown him up to Tikrit. Our, our counterpart, our, our other troop, um, was based out of Tikrit. So we had one troop in Baghdad, one troop in Tikrit, and then some guys at some other locations around the country. But, um, so they flew him up to our t- our troop in Tikrit and, and they conducted a, a close target reconnaissance with him to try to get him to, to point out the actual locations where Saddam would be. Um, and we loaded in the vehicles in Baghdad um, and drove to Tikrit. That's like a two-hour uh, drive. It is, yeah. And, you know, we were in the – kind of in the early stages of worrying about IEDs. But you still had right, route yeah. planning. And you still had – you know, so we're driving. And kind of on the way, it was this evolution of thought. We were, we were bitching and moaning, as soldiers do. doesn't matter what organization you're in about, oh, God, here we go again. Like, we got two hours of sleep. Now they got us driving all the way to Decred. It's going to turn into nothing. They got us running all over the country. And then kind of as it went on, and, like, nothing changed. Like, we're just headed in that direction. You know, we started to do the, well, what, what if this is it? <laughs> like, what if, what if this guy really does know something that nobody else did? So we get to Decred, and they had done the close target reconnaissance with him. Um, and they go, yep, we have two locations. We have a farm outside of Samara. And then we have a, a house in Samara. Um, so we're going to have to do a split. One troop will take one location. One troop will take the other. I think there was a little infighting that was above my level about who was going to take what. And I think it was based on where we actually thought he was going to be. But long story short, my troop ended up with um, his cook's house, uh, which was in, in town. And then the, the troop that did the close target of Constance was going to hit the farm that was outside of town which consequently was the cook. It was his family's farm. So you had the cook, his wife in town, and then you had his brothers on this farm outside of town. And so, you know, hours passed, nightfall came, um, we launched, it was, you know, kind of a combination of things. We had some air assets, but, but most of it was, uh, most of the assault force was ground-based. Um, we ended up hitting the two locations, uh, again, I was a breacher, so I, I ended up blowing a, a, a gate charge outside the cook's house in Samara and then, and then blew his front door in and we assaulted the house. And the only two people in the house were, were this guy, the, the personal chef case was his name and, and, uh, his wife. Um, and then the assault on the farm went down simultaneously. Uh, and the report came back from them that was a dry hole. Um, but we knew that we had this cook that, that, uh, Muslid had had ID'd as as Saddam's personal chef, um, so you know a little bit of bat- battlefield interrogation there, and and uh, you know it wasn't me. I was I was standing there, but our our troop sergeant major at the time, you know, did a good job having a conversation with this guy. And one of the questions he asked him was, "If it's just you and your wife here, why do you have you know forty pounds of fish in your freezer?" And as simple as that, the the case caved and said because I'm Saddam's personal chef and I have all that fish because he eats fish every day and I, and I bring it to him like, just like that. So all this time, all these targets and all of a sudden all these dominoes fall into place. So we, (laughs) we, we attempted to get case to point out where the farm was on a map. Um, We had some satellite imagery and then we had some regular old maps 
Um, that was a futile exercise. Obviously, a random Iraqi doesn't know how to read a map, um, mm-hmm. and he certainly has never looked at satellite imagery. So we decided that we were going to put him in a vehicle and drive him out to the location of the other troop where they had done an assault and hadn't found anything. Mind you, hadn't fired a shot, hadn't made any noise. Nobody knew they were out there. They had quietly, under night vision, hit this this other farm. Um, so we drove Case out to the location, and he literally said, no, that's that's not the farm. That's the wrong location. It's the next one down. So I guess it's a last-ditch effort. Mooselet, when they did the close target reconnaissance, had pointed out one farm off, hoping that we would hit that farm and it would give Saddam a chance to escape. Um, but the, the chef rolled over and said, no, it's not that one. It's this one. Um, so long story short, they, they flexed, hit the second farm. Um, after the target was taken down, they discovered, you know, the hole, uh, which was basically a rug. Um, and there was a rope sticking out from under the rug in the courtyard, um, pulled the rug back. And it was a, basically like a styrofoam cork, pulled the cork out of the hole. And Saddam was in there with his hands above his head. Wow. Did you actually go down in the hole? I did not. Um, yeah, that was the, my personal joke is I was always one guy away. Um, so uh, I was, I was the team that rolled up the guy that gave up Saddam, but I ended up hitting the cook's house, which was the guy that pointed out where he eventually was. Right. And and I wasn't actually there pulling him out of the hole. Um, but, uh, it happened again years later with, with, uh, with Zarqawi, we hit a target, um, and actually, rolled up all the guys that ended up giving up Zarqawi. And then, you know, eventually he was, they dropped bombs on his location and then hit that target and Zarqawi was killed. But again, I was one off, <laughs> which I'm okay with. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Uh, wh- what did you say to Walt when you guys got back to base? You know, the guy, uh, good friend, phenomenal dude, but everything that he said was correct. Um, and, and there's there's been a ton of books written um, but the combination of our intelligence guy solely and, and an interrogator that we recruited out of the regular army, um, a guy named Eric Maddox, kind of between those two and, and the help of some other folks internal to our organization, that's really how that stuff got done. So, I, you know, I've never been more proud of an intelligence community member than I, than I was of him. Um, he, you know... A lot of those things will never be known, but but it really wasn't a just big combined effort. It was it was just a handful of guys that kind of made that happen. Pretty awesome story to say the least. Uh, you, you mentioned the you know Zarqawi hit that you were on that one, but you still have probably what six or seven other deployments that you went on. Uh, anything of note that, that you know you want to share from any of those trips? Uh, well, that's broad. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, it's just. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I mean, tons. I mean, we, we, I, you know, I've said to folks before I I was, I was fortunate to have good timing. Um, I just, you know, my, my first trip with my team in a special mission unit was on combat deployment to Afghanistan. And that was, you know, just post nine 11. I did the invasion of Iraq. Um, some other stuff in between, uh, redeployed in Oh four, um, after the capture of Saddam, obviously, um, and that was sort of the transition point from deck of cards to, to true counterterrorism operation as, as the foreign fighter network was established and they started flooding guys from various places in the Middle East and Africa into, into Iraq. Uh, so, you know, my, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that I got a lot of commando on a lot of times. Um, mm-hmm. but I also got to do a lot of things that, that special forces guys don't get to do in, in that, you in know, I, sense? I, did, I did that desert mobility mission. That's not a common thing. Um, it's something that's trained on now, but it wasn't common practice in what we did. Um, when we switched from deck of cards to counterterrorism, you know, that was a very uh, helicopter centric phase where we were doing a lot of land on the X assaults. Um, a lot of targets where, you know, true, true CQB, speed, surprise, violence of action, kind of all over the country of Iraq. Um, you know, those next few deployments sort of escalated to where, uh, yeah, I think I've said it in the past, the, the, you know, in the early days, Oh, two, Oh, three, Oh, four, you know, you might get in a gunfight, you know, once every 10, 11 assaults. 
um, by 0506, it was a daily occurrence. So yeah. the battlefield changed. Um, our missions changed. But, uh, you know, like a highlight that I've never talked about, and I said earlier that, you know, the, intel- the intelligence community evolved. It got better. Um, we got better. The assets got better. The ability to, to effectively target got better. And if there's a memorable moment that sticks out, which there's hundreds, but um, a, kind of a unique one was when we first started doing – uh, helicopter-based vehicle interdiction. So broad daylight, we were using various intelligence collection platforms to to kind of target bad guys. Um, and <clears throat> when they would cross large stretches of land on a road, um, we would use helicopters to basically run them down and catch them while they weren't in a hardened structure. Um, it was easier to capture them in a vehicle. So you know, one helicopter would be responsible for initiating the stop of that vehicle by various means, and the other would land after the vehicle had stopped and kind of assault up to that vehicle and secure its occupants. Um, and so, one particular day, you know, we were at the time we were at at, Bag, or at uh, <clears throat> Balad Airfield, and we would watch these these ISR these intelligence aerial platform, you know imagery assets we would watch these feeds all day and it was literally watching like watching television and we would rotate through and keep notes on various guys and vehicles and houses and locations and and we were very involved in the intelligence collection portion because it was so extensive and lo and behold a couple of guys that we were targeting you know they broke the box as we say so they were in a vehicle they were moving from a to b and and we were given a launch order so we roll out um we're about to the helicopter and they say, hold on, you know, the guys are driving in town. So we come back inside and we're watching. And as we're watching, these two guys pull up to a, to a gas station, to a petrol station, kind of a rural one. Uh, and there's a tractor trailer there. They get out of their car. They go up to the tractor trailer. At gunpoint, they remove the occupants of the tractor trailer. They take those two guys and they stick them in the trunk of their car. And two guys get in. I think there were three or four of them, but two guys get in the car with the dudes in their trunk that they had just kidnapped. And the other two get in the tractor trailer and the tractor trailer goes one way. And the guys in the car with the dudes in the trunk go the other way. And we said, screw it. It's now a hostage rescue. We don't know who these guys are, but they just picked the wrong day to do a car jacking. Um, so we get in the helicopters, we launch, we fly out, we conduct a stop. Um, the guys end up coming out guns blazing and and you know lose that fight but uh you know i get to the car and i open the trunk and here's these two iraqis staring at me and that moment it dawned on me no wonder they think we are the greatest country in the world and we have eyes everywhere because these dudes literally were kidnapped like 11 minutes ago (laughs) and americans just killed the people that kidnapped them and let them out of the trunk of the car that they were stuffed in and i thought that's got to be one of the most commando moments I have ever been a part of. Wow! Did you end up finding out who the guy, who the guys who did the kidnapping were? Yeah, we did. I mean, they the, at, at that point in the war, everything we were doing was related to who was running the foreign fighter network, the destabilization efforts in Iraq. So they were all tied to to Zarqawi um, in various different roles but uh if i remember correctly those two cats were responsible for moving foreign fighters in and out of that particular area you know it's interesting with the unit you were in uh, and i was in baghdad 0506 for the first time and i was with fifth and tenth group and we did more foreign internal defense than anything right i mean that was that was the main mission sure those guys had had targets to go get and bad guys to roll up but their main mission was training the ISOC brigade and building that whole force up so it could you know do the transition. You guys never got caught up in any of that, did you? Uh, n- not so much. No. Um, later on, ironically, I I did a a true UW style Green Beret straight out of Robin Sage mission several years later in, in, in 07 and 08 in the Horn of Africa. Right. But, but, I, but I did it as an SMU guy. Um, and then post unit career, I actually ended up in first special forces command working as a green beret doing equipping for, for the special forces regiment. Um, so force modernization, that stuff. Um, but 
I'm in the camp of Green Berets are the best in the world at doing that job, and and they shouldn't shy away from doing it. By through and with is an absolute necessary task that has gone on in every conflict since the beginning of time. Um, it's one of the most effective ways to get things done on the battlefield, and it's one of the most effective ways to get things done without getting Americans killed. Yeah, and um, what you mean by that, for just for the audience who may not be military, you mean you know using the indigenous force of the country that you're in to, to assist what you're doing? Absolutely. Okay. So, so I... Um, you know, and there's things that Green Berets do. You know, there's the language specialty. They speak the language. There's learning how to how to train, how to teach, how to instruct basic level tasks to teach indigenous peoples to 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 fight their own fights. And I, I felt like it was I, I felt like at the time it was a bit detrimental to the special forces community, to the Green Beret community for them to try to, you know, everybody wants to do direct action. Right. And and, and, and I think, you know, movies and books and all that crap has a lot to do with that because they think it's sexy, but it's just not. Um, and all those pieces are critical on the battlefield and everybody's got to do their role. And I think, you know, they should take pride in being the best at doing that role versus, you know, trying to be a trigger puller all the time. How much loss have you had to deal with throughout your career? Well, uh, I'm going to do good today. So I, I, I lost count at about 33. Um, I lost, uh, I lost my best friend in 05, um, along with a bunch of other unit members. Um, but that was the first, was that in uh, Iraq? Yeah, that was in Iraq. Um, that was probably the most catastrophic to me. Uh, you know, teammates, coworkers, uh, fellow unit members, um, and then guys that I've served with elsewhere in the military, uh, again, I, I think I stopped counting at about 33. Um, and it, and it never really stops. A couple of years ago, I lost another really good friend post service. Um, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about recovery and transition for veterans and is why I do this is, is to be exposed and to make people feel like it's okay to be vulnerable and and to have issues and to work through those issues and be comfortable doing so. I had a buddy that, you know, was medically retired, got out. Um, I call it getting off the roller coaster. It's very hard to go from the existence that we lived to civilian life. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and guys tend to fill that void with different things. When you, when you take away the, the adrenaline, the emotion of, of combat and repeated combat deployments, it's a hard vacuum to fill. And, and Brandon chose to fill it with with base jumping, um, a bit of an adrenaline junkie, something that he loved. We talked about it openly. He knew that's what he was doing. Um, and he tragically died in a base jumping accident uh, in Georgia a few years back. And and that one stung. That was that was a guy. That was something that didn't have to happen. That you know he was working through his own healing process and filling a void with something that was very dangerous, and he paid the ultimate price. When you lose so many of your, your brothers in combat, you know, you stayed at this for over 20 years. During the actual, you know, deployments and missions and everything else, did the thought ever creep into your head, hey, man, this is too much. Like, the, eventually it's got to be me, right? Because, I mean, I, I, you know, I mentioned it all the time that you, you can all roll the dice so many times before you crap out in combat. Like eventually everybody's number is going to get called. Like you, you just know you're going to get into some stuff and, and how many times can you keep dancing with the devil, so to speak, before something bad happens to you? Did, did you ever have that thought? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> after Oh five, um, my, uh, I've been saying this for years, you know, everything sort of changed for me. We lost so many people that year and I lost people that were really close to me. Um, that, it became impersonal. Um, it changed the way that we lived our lives. It changed the way that we interacted with people or definitely did for me. Um, I, I guess I'll tell you a funny story first. Uh, I got shot twice, um, both times in training. <laughs> oh God. So you're one guy off and the time you got shot wasn't even real. Yeah. Okay. Noted. So, so, so the joke was, you know, I, or at least my joke, I don't know if anybody else ever got it. But my joke was I got all my bad luck out in training. Right. Um, 
and you know they're both fluke events, whatever. But I still have shrapnel on my body this day. Uh, deployment wise, you know, guys all look at it a little differently. There's guys that are faith based that that you know that are are grounded in their religion and believe that when it's their time to go, it's their time to go. Yeah. Um. And that and that's how they work through that. There's guys that are uh, confidence based, if you will, mm-hmm. in that I'm I'm. I'm the best at this. I'm better than the bad guys and I'm surrounded by the best and that's going to get me through it. And then there's guys that just try to ignore it. Um, I was probably a combination of ignoring it and thinking I'm, I'm better or I'm surrounded by greatness that it's just not going to happen to me. I will tell you that in between those Oh five and Oh six tours, uh, you know, I was married at the time and, you know, in a bad marriage, but, you know, one of the things I told my wife was I'm, I'm not ready to go back. And I was scared. Um, I was scared because we, we weren't untouchable anymore and, and guys were dying and guys were dying on the regular. And I was a part of the most elite unit in the world and knew we were that much better. But I also had the realization that shit happens that sometimes it's just not your day. Oh, and so you can't control everything. As much as we think we can control everything in combat, you know, that's the pragmatic viewpoint. If I stick to my training yeah. and I do what I'm trained to do, you know, the, 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 the process says the results will bear out something favorable for us, right? But you can't control right. everything in combat. It, it's impossible right. to. So uh, th- there's that part of it that always kind of creeps in the back of your mind. Yeah, so for me, you know, about the time that I, I was probably mentally at my – uh, I don't know, a breaking point, if you will. Um, I was physically starting having, having some issues. I was dealing with stress and other things in unhealthy ways. I was in a bad marriage. Um, but I went through a transition at the unit where I left a saber squadron and I started doing, you know, some different stuff, some clandestine stuff, um, different operational environment, different theater, didn't know I was going to get in a gunfight you know, kind of things evolve. But I think that alone, that transition helped me to continue on for a couple more years. It's always interesting how people deal with fear. Uh, and it's, I'm, I always ask the question and sometimes I feel stupid asking, are you afraid? Because, you know, it, it sounds silly to say, I think generally everybody's afraid. Some people want to admit it. Some people don't, but you, you were just very candid about that. Um, how do you handle the fear? I mean, I think fight or flight is a good response or, or a good a good explanation. Um, I think when you're trained at an extremely high level and you have that confidence in the man on your left and your right, um, fear is a good thing. Fear helps shape your actions. It helps shape your decisions. Uh, and every time that you experience fear, it shapes the way that you approach that next objective. So – you know, I, I will always say this to this day. The thing that makes U.S. Army Special Operations better than anybody else in the world or in the Department of Defense is that we breed leaders. And we breed leaders through experience, and they use that experience to shape how they approach things. So we contingency plan better than any organization in the world. It doesn't mean that we always get it right, but it means that we try our hardest to think about the most things that can go wrong before we get into some shit. You know, just to, anecdotally for me, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I was with 5th and 10th group, but I'm not a tab guy. I'm not a Green Beret. And I was just fortunate enough to be placed in that environment. And I can tell you this much. I mean, I, you know, wasn't trained the way Green Berets were. And so I'm coming from a different skill set. But when I was out on missions with those guys and I was fortunate enough, you know, to do that, I was, I never wanted to say I was afraid, but it was almost relieving to me to see other guys sort of experience fear. Like they never said it, but I could see it. You could sense it, how guys are reacting and when their senses were up. And that was enough for me to say, okay, they're normal. Like I get it. They're better trained than I am. And they have a completely different skill set. but at least what they're feeling is the same that I'm feeling. And it sort of was relatable. If that makes any sense, it made me more confident to know that I wasn't the only one standing there going, Oh shit, something bad's about to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and everybody deals with it differently, right? Some guys get hyper alert. Some guys get hyperactive. Yep. Some some guys that 
that aren't good at dealing with it may may freeze up. I, I was a humor guy. I was the guy that in a gunfight would make a joke. Oh, same here. Um, yeah. Yeah, like that that was just my need to, need to cut the my, room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's my, it's been my way of dealing with stress forever and I did it in combat and it worked for me. It it allowed my brain to go <laughs> this really sucks, but that's pretty funny. Okay, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. Um and I, but I agree with you. Like seeing that human side of people um is a good thing and and it's you get to understand your mates better in those environments than you could in a lifetime of not being in a situation like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I was on a mission and a, a, a captain, uh, you know, a, a, an alpha team leader who I was with in the back of a truck, you know, we were going around. He said, man, when I get nervous, I become a chatty captain. He just kept talking. I'm like, okay, I, I can understand that. You know, like th- there are guys who won't shut up, you know, when something bad's about to happen. And it always just, st- that moment always stuck with me. Uh, and that was one of the most relatable moments I had from somebody I looked up to. You know, we were both captains, but it was just, you know, obviously he was a, a much high, more highly trained individual than I was. But it, again, it goes back to that relatable factor and that humanizing factor that I think is so important to see from people at times. All right. So uh, you do 20 years. How do you know when it's time to hang up? Was it just because you got the 20 plus or there was something that was a seminal moment that said, OK, it's time for me to go? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I like I said early on in the podcast, I, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Um I, I don't, I'm not making any excuses, uh, but, but shit adds up after a while. And, and, you know, in order to learn healthy ways to deal with things, sometimes you have to experience some unhealthy ways of dealing with things. Um, so I was kind of in the middle of that in, uh, in, you know, 06, 07, 08, I was, I was a high functioning alcoholic. I was chasing away the demons when I wasn't working. I was only comfortable on a deployment, um, and I ended up making a, a, another mistake, uh, a, a error in judgment um, that caused me to leave the organization. Uh, I was lucky in that I, I had friends kind of all over, and I had a friend that connected me to another friend, um, and I ended up finding a job um, doing doing force modernization for First Special Forces Command. So. I was supporting Green Berets. I was responsible for equipping, for for testing, developing, and procuring new equipment for all the Green Berets in the Army. Um, Work was kind of all I had at the moment, and I kind of dove headlong into that. Uh, I didn't care about promotion. I had a few years left in the Army. I I really just cared about the guys, and I was lucky and fortunate to be surrounded and the ability to surround myself with some really good folks, some guys from all different sides of special ops and various backgrounds. I learned some good lessons in there that, you know, you you don't ever underestimate anyone. You never know a guy's story. Um, And just because a guy wasn't in the same unit as you, he could be conventional. He could be a soft skill MOS, as they say, it it doesn't mean that he doesn't have life experience. It's irrelevant. Um, And I, I healed, I got better as a person. And I realized that, you know, developing equipment and innovating and coming up with new things and continuing to support the guys on the battlefield was really important to me. So I started thinking about transition. I started thinking about what I was going to do next. I knew that my days of toting a gun were over. Um, It wasn't that I didn't enjoy it. I just didn't want to be a guy that chased the rainbow, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, I was working on my own recovery, you know, chemical dependency. I'd been through a, a pill phase and I'd almost taken my own life at one point. Um, but, you know, a combination of things and people and, and self-awareness and growth uh, kind of got me to a point where, okay, maybe I don't, I don't need to do that stuff. I don't want to train people. I don't want to be on a range the rest of my life. You know, I've carried a gun for 20 years. I'm good. But at the same time, I still want to be connected to the community. I still want to contribute. Um, and so that force modernization job, that equipment development piece, you know, getting to meet with industry, getting to know companies, understanding what people do, learning kind of the business side and how it interacts with defense was appealing to me. Um, and eventually, you know, I met some folks and built some relationships um, and ended up getting offered an opportunity to go work for a, for a body armor and tactical nylon company, Tier Tactical. And uh, I, I made that decision very late, just before retirement. I had some other opportunities that I was considering, but Tier seemed like a good fit. It was It was the owner. CEO Jason Beck. It was his second company. He owned a, <clears throat> a company called Diamondback Tactical Prior. 
mm-hmm. and uh, had, had sold that and had a two year hiatus, you know, non compete in the industry, and then started Tier Tactical and said, I want to focus on on special operations, on high end tactical law enforcement. Uh, and I want to do it globally for the U.S. and for its partners. Um, and he offered me an opportunity originally to come in and, and kind of help him do design work. I mean, I used to build my own kit years ago when we would have a new mission set. And we didn't we didn't have all the stuff that guys have now back then. So we used to build it. And I taught myself to sew and kind of I understood that side of it. But he gave me an opportunity and it evolved into, hey, would you mind coming out and being my number two? Um because he needed somebody they could trust. He needed a teammate that, you know, could look at the bigger picture. And, and, and honestly, the joke of it is, is be his contingency planner. Be the guy that points out the what ifs and the what coulds and the have you thought about this? And I've been doing that for 20 years. Um, and the kit side was easy. I knew the community. I knew the end user. Uh, you know, TTPs change. So I don't give my opinion on anything they do or anything they ask. But what I can do is I can listen. And I, it comes from a place of understanding, and I really appreciated the ability to be able to take end users' needs and capability gaps and build a solution to fix those problems. You've been removed from direct action for a considerable amount of time. What, if anything, is the most you miss about that experience? <laughs> the adrenaline rush. Um the euphoria that comes with combat is everything about life is crisper after a life and death experience. Yeah. And when, when you, when you conduct a successful operation and you, everybody comes through it. Okay. And you achieve your objective. Um, that, release of endorphins that occurs afterwards is like nothing else in the world. Um, I, the joke of it now, part of, part of my personal healing process was I am a big hiker. Um, I, my wife and I literally travel the world and backpack all over. And when I retired, I, I hiked the, the John Muir trail with my wife. So 21 straight days, 10 plus miles a day, you know, 40, 50, 60 pounds on our back, self-sustained. And when I did that, I realized that planning for a long distance through hike is exactly like planning for a combat operation. Um, there's the logistical planning. Where am I going to resupply? What am I going to carry? How are we going to divide our load? What happens if bad weather comes in? There's all these things that you did that were relatable to what I used to do for all those years doing that stuff that I liked it. It filled that void. At the same time, being out in nature and being away from it all, um, you know, I had a guy say to me one time, the, the greatest thing about hiking and being in the backcountry is you appreciate it with all of your senses. You know, the sights are incredible and they change constantly as you move. The sounds, you know, the birds, the trees, the water, you know, the feel of the pack on your back, the feel of your feet on the ground, the pain and suffering that goes with covering long distances. All those things were relatable. And when you set out to do a long distance through hike, something that's physically challenging, that's mentally demanding um, and, and requires a lot of planning, when you accomplish that, it is as close as I've ever gotten to how you feel at the completion of a mission. Um, so for me, it was cathartic. It was this healing thing that I could do that wasn't putting myself in harm's way, so to speak, but helped me kind of fill that vacuum of getting off the roller coaster of... I go to war, I come home, I go to war, I come home. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting, you talk about the void, uh, and you mentioned your friend who was, who was base jumping to fill the void. You work with transition now, and guys figuring out what's next. Uh, I assume filling that void is at the top of the list that veterans have to do in order to come clear on the other side of transition. Uh, absolutely. Uh, being real with yourself, first of all, being vulnerable and not being afraid to be vulnerable and share who you are. One of the reasons that I talk now, which it took me a whole lot of years to be able to do that was literally to show people that it's okay. It's okay to go. Yup. I almost took my life in a moment of weakness or whatever you want to call it. I was overcome by events and I almost got there, but I didn't do it. And nowadays when I talk to people, what I like to do is I like to remind them, Hey, look, man, 
the stuff that made you great in the service, the things that made you excel, those qualities, those traits of you as a person that really have nothing to do with the military, those things that made you successful, that's the same stuff that can make you successful in whatever you choose to do next. So in transition, have an open mind, find a place, find a team that you like, because team is what you've been a part of for decades. And it's where you're comfortable. And if it's not, if you want to lead or you want to do it on your own, fine. But remember that you're, you're at your core, those things that made you successful the first time are the same things that can make you successful again. You don't have to identify with what you do professionally. You don't have to define yourself with what you do for a living. You define yourself by your core values and your, and your personal traits and your attributes. And, and what you do is just what you do. And that can be anything and you can be successful at it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, you know, I'm still on the guard and, and I know there's going to be a point in time where I have to take the uniform off and I say it all the time. I, I've been in the military over half my life. I don't know an adult life without the army. And that's daunting even to think about it. I mean, I'm a grown man. Like, yeah, I got family. I got a job. I got a hundred things going on. But that sits in the back of my mind and I'm very fearful of what my life is like, even though it's only the guard, right? It's only a weekend a month, theoretically, you know, in two weeks during the summer, theoretically, but you know, neither here nor there, but you know, th that whole life without the uniform is it's scary. It, yeah. It's really scary. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not naive to the fact that I'm fortunate that I still get to touch the community. Right. I'm, I'm not wearing a uniform, but I still support it. And I think even if you weren't in the defense space, you know, having said everything I just said about, you know, whatever it is that you decide to do, you could apply those same things and be successful. I think it's important for us because that's such a part of who we are. It's like our family that you still stay somewhat connected, whether it's through charity or organizations or attending an event or whatever. I think that's just part of who we are. And I think it's OK to hold on to that side of it. Um, but I, I think a veteran helps develop who you are. It doesn't divide, define who you are if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So w while I support it, I don't live on the fact that I'm a veteran. Um, you know, when I meet people today, I want them to respect me for what I do and who I am today to, you know, the culmination of all those experiences that I've had have made me who I am today. And I think it's a better person than I was 20 years ago. Um, but you know, that service is a part of me, but it doesn't define me. But it doesn't mean that I can't continue to serve and support that in some fashion. Very pointedly said. I mean, listen, it's an amazing journey for you. Uh, and, and I say journey because I know it's not over. There's more to it, uh, particularly not only for you uh, as you continue to touch the defense world, as you just mentioned, but, you know, personally and, and whatever's next as you continue to help veterans and, you know, the passion for helping them transition to the next phase of their life is uh, something that that veterans know better than anybody else. I know there's a lot of great people out there who want to help and a lot of great organizations out there who want to help. But in reality, nobody's better at taking care of us than us. Um, and, and you being at the forefront of that, I think is so pivotal, uh, especially for this next phase of warriors. That's going to move on to something different. Yeah. I couldn't have said that better myself. Well, Chris, again, uh, congratulations on an amazing career. Uh, and I know the next phase of yours will equally be as successful, but I certainly thank you for, uh, for sharing so much with us and, and being open and honest and, and certainly just thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Yeah, I appreciate you having me and, and keep doing good work, man. Thanks. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.